Our speaker today is John Halloway. He is currently the supervisor of the Division of Motor Vehicles Medical Review and Fitness Unit. John has been working with the Division of Motor Vehicles since July 2011 and has been a successful small business owner in the private sector for over eight years. John is a graduate from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. A diagnosis of dementia is not in itself a reason to stop driving. One in three people with dementia still drives. What matters from a legal and practical point of view is whether the person is still able to drive safely. Let's welcome John. Well, thank you, Diane. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me here today to talk about dementia and driving. It's an honor for the Division of Motor Vehicles to be able to do this community outreach and inform the general public of our practices and how we operate as a, as a business. Um, a brief background about myself, as I had mentioned, um, I'm a DMV supervisor. Um, I supervise the medical review and fitness unit. We have 12 staff within my unit. So when you're thinking of all of DMV and all of the state of Wisconsin, 12 people handle my area of expertise or our area of expertise, which is medical review and fitness, as well as CDL drivers. So we regulate all of the safety behind that element. Um, I've been with DMV since 2011. DMV, or the Division of Motor Vehicles, is, is a division of the Department of Transportation, which has uh, state patrol, ETSD. Um, we maintain your highways, we maintain your roadways, we also regulate the safety on that, um, as well as license issuance, vehicle registration, identification cards, and ha what have you. Um, I started my career in the Bureau of Field Services, now I'm currently in Driver Services. So. Um, field services is what most people think of of the DMV when you hear that word or that acronym. Um, and that's where you're going to go to renew your license, get your identification card, renew your license plate, title a new vehicle that you may have just purchased. Um, that's the front line or the face of the DMV, as we like to call it. So I spent a year and three months working as a counter service agent. Um, and then because of my business expertise outside of DMV, um, I was successful in promoting to supervisor. Um, I've worked in various DMV service centers from the, the five day offices like the Madison offices um, to supervising the smaller service centers that may be in our area that we're in currently or around the other state that have maybe two days a week you're open or one day a month or one day every other week depending on the week or the location. So I have experience in all types of service centers that you may be going to or your loved ones may be going to and, and that has led me to, to learn a lot about both vehicle registration and driver's license identification issues. Um, and then I, I, I decided to take my career a step further and transfer to a central office. So now I'm, I'm not in that face-to-face -face service center anymore. Um, we hold, hold a call center, and a very small one. We probably take 500 to 600 calls a week um, between the 12 staff that I oversee. Um, but we focus specifically on medical review um, of, of all drivers. So um, Division of Motor Vehicles is made up of three bureaus. Field services, which like I said, is our base of the DMV. Driver services, which is where I, I'm in, and we currently focus mainly on drivers and identification card products. And then there is vehicle, Bureau of uh, Vehicle Services, and they focus solely on vehicle registration, titling, and what have you. So I've been in driver services for a little over a year, expanding my knowledge of how we do things here, and that's mainly why I'm here today, because of that area. Um, medical review is focused solely on, on medical conditions in return or in relation to the safety on the roadways. And I want to remind you that that's our main objective at DMV is safety. Whether that's safety of the information that you're presenting to us for your vehicle registration, or for your identification documents, um, but the safety on the road and behind the wheel as well. That's what we're all about. Um, so that's a brief history on me. Today I'm going to run through a few areas um, with dementia and driving. I'm going to talk about how does dementia affect driving. We're going to touch on signs or what to look for. Uh, the DMV's process, what can you do, and then how can DMV help? So today's presentation isn't designed to be me talking before you and not having you have interactions back, and I know especially before lunch that you might get anxious. So um, if you have a question on something that I've said or that I touched on and you want a little more clarification, feel free to raise your hand. This could be a, 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 an informal back and forth all day long, because that's what we're here for. We're here to help. We're here to answer any questions that you might have, okay? Um, if you don't have any questions or you want to save it to the end and pull me aside before I get out of here, I'm certainly okay with that as well. So, dementia and driving. <laughs> driving demands quick reaction time, fast decision making, right? You all know behind the wheel, 
a number of things could happen. Something could fall off the truck in front of you. Um, something could run out in front of you. Myself, personally, I've hit three deer in the last year alone. Oh. My insurance company loves me. <laughs> <laughs> you should know that you can't lose insurance because of hitting a deer. It's an animal-related accident. It's only $100 your <laughs> <laughs> um, write that down. Yeah. But they can't increase your premiums. No, it doesn't. Really? Nope, that's, I wasn't going to call the second one in. And then after the third one, I'm like, whatever. Just old hat. <laughs> um, so because of the demand for a quick reaction time and fast decision making, uh, a person with Alzheimer's will eventually become unable to drive. And the key to that is that they're, just because they're diagnosed with that doesn't mean it's an instant we need to pull your license. It's going to happen over time. And every case is different. It could be faster. It could be slower. So the key is, is the people around them, the loved ones that interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. They're going to be the ones that can assist DMV and assist everyone in the process of getting them safe behind the wheel, if they should be at all. Um, like I said, dealing with the issue early on will help ease the transition um, from getting the license um, taken away. So how does DMV, or how does DMV, how does dementia affect driving? Um, as mentioned, the diagnosis of dementia is not in itself a reason to stop driving. One in three people with dementia still drive. What matters is whether the person is able to operate the vehicle safely. And like I said, that's the division's policy. We're all about safety. I, I want the big takeaway from today to be that this isn't an age thing that my unit focuses on. That's the big misconception when we get calls from the public or, or letters from the public or senators even, that we're discriminating or we're doing this because of age. Why are you doing this to me just because I'm getting older? And it's not the case. We see all age groups coming into my unit for all different types of reasoning. But the main focus that you come to our unit, or the main reason that we understand to be working with you, is because of a medical condition that may have changed or impacted your life. And we just want to ensure that you're safe. We want to ensure that you're safe on the roadways, not only for yourself, for your loved ones, for those that may be in the car with you, or for myself and my family driving next to you on the highway as well. Um, we want to be able to know that you're safe in, in both your attention and your concentration. Um, driving takes the ability to focus on different things multiple, or at the same time, I should say. Sorry, I'm rambling over here. Um, you got to take into account my driving on the way here. I didn't encounter any roundabouts, but there are roundabouts showing up in places that are unexpected now because it helps the flow of traffic. Um, and you need to be able to adapt to the changing roadways. If something may have always been the same way for you, but all of a sudden now there's a stop sign on a roadway because it's been deemed uh, an accident-prone area. Um, you have to have problem-solving skills behind the wheel of visual spatial skills. So when we're talking about that, your vision over time may become disoriented or may become um, not as good as it was when you were younger. And so we want to make sure that your vision can see to meet the Wisconsin standards, which isn't the strongest standards, um, but we do have standards nonetheless. So we want to make sure that your vision is good. We want to make sure that anything that you're doing behind the wheel is, is um, able to be, I say this, that you're safe to operate what you're choosing to operate, whether it's a motorcycle or a regular car. Um, problem solving skills, as I mentioned, roundabouts will seem to be a big problem for, for drivers who aren't experienced with them, and they're showing up in places that you don't expect them. Um, and the road will go from 55 to, to 35, um, and the roundabout will take you there or slow you down, and you don't expect that. Um, the reaction and processing skills um, to avoid an accident is, is something that you need to focus on with problem solving, like I said something falls off the truck in front of you, or the vehicle in front of you swerves into your lane by accident to avoid something in the roadway, whether that's animal, or something else that fell off the vehicle, or, or, or debris from maybe a recent storm where we had a lot of winds with trees down the um, Judgment decision making. Um, there's a lot that goes into driving. You need to be able to judge the distance from the vehicle in front of you or from the vehicles next to you. You need to be able to judge the stopping distance of your vehicle and what your condition may be with that vehicle. So if you're driving a heavier vehicle, it may take you longer to stop. You may need to remember that. Typically, the older drivers and the senior drivers drive larger cars, right? How often do you see a Buick on the roadways um, with, with an elderly couple out for the day on their Sunday stroll, especially this time of year with the leaves turning and the, and the beautiful colors that Wisconsin offers? So all of these things need to be taken into consideration when you put them behind the wheel. We want to make sure that you're safe. Uh, and reaction time and processing skills. These kind of all tied together. Um, you, you, you need to be able to properly react to what's changing on the roadways around you. Um, you all know that in Wisconsin, the weather can change on a dime. What it might be a clear fall day is going to turn into a windy, rainy day. Um, and you're going to need to be able to react appropriately and, and ensure that your vehicle can operate that, and that you can control the vehicle safely wherever you may be going. Continuing on, 
So a safe driver also needs to be patient and calm. Memory loss, is, which is a major early symptom of dementia, um, does not generally keep the stronger there. Different kinds of memory are needed for safe driving. For example, remembering a route, um, change gear, or what road size you need. Um, we want to be able to drive, or we want to be able to ensure that you're not driving too slowly when you're behind the wheel. When you start to, to lose your focus, you tend to slow down, right? You tend to not be as confident behind the wheel. So you might be going 55 on the highway, but all of a sudden you don't know where you're going. So you're going to ease off the gas a little bit. And then the oncoming traffic behind you is affected by that. And they might be anxious to get to where they're going and they want to get around you. So they're going to squeeze around you in that passing lane if they can, or sometimes when they shouldn't be passing, which is something that we don't want. So driving too fast is equally dangerous, but driving too slow is just as dangerous as driving too fast. And a lot of people forget that element of driving. You don't really hear uh, that people are ticketed or cited as much for, for driving too slowly, but it is just as, as strong of a factor. Um, signaling incorrectly, um, leaving your blinker on just for a long period of time because you forgot that it was on, right? Or that you um, intend to turn right, but all of a sudden, oh, I've changed my mind, and then you forget that it's on because you don't hear the blinker nowadays with modern technology. Those blinkers are, are super quiet, um, so it's not a distraction. You may not see it flashing in your in your dashboard. Um, we want to make sure that, that people, again, have control over their vehicle, and the signal is, a, is an sign of intent. So the drivers around you, pedestrians even walking, know, oh, this person's turning, or they're slowing down to turn. And, and you may see someone's blinker come on, and there's not a road to turn on, right? So then what do you, what do you think they're doing? Are they pulling off to the side of a road because of a vehicle malfunction, or are they, are they just, did they bump it and not know that it's on there because they were adjusting their, their hands? Um, difficulty with control. The big thing that we see with people who have this type of problem is that they, they turn wide, or they turn short, or they, they park and they take up two stalls, and they, they might not even know that they're taking up two stalls. How many times have you gone to Walmart, seen an open space, only to find that when you get there, you can't fit your vehicle there because the other line, or the other car is parked just over that line. Or decided to do it the, uh, um, so those are big, big control issues. Um, you can notice the loved ones in your life, you can look at their vehicles and you can see when they might have control issues, because a lot of times they'll hit objects, um, cars, curbs, um, parking parking stops and stuff like that, um, and they'll have damage to their car, and you can ask them about it, and they likely don't remember it. Um, if they do remember it, they, they're not sure on how it really got there, or if it was really their fault, or if it was just you when you borrowed their car. For the <laughs> it's funny, but it's true. Um, you can, when you're riding with your, your loved ones or the people that you suspect may have difficulty with control, you'll notice it right away because you're going to be jerked around, um, other cars are going to be honking at you, um, they're going to have confusion at exits or confusion where they're going sometimes. This is something that you'll have to, to, to personally decide. Is this what I should be doing? Is this the safest spot for me to be? Um, or should we get mom some help? Um, and as I kind of mentioned, accidents have been prevented. So these all kind of tie together. Um, you signal incorrectly and someone's going to have an accident with you because they thought your intention was to turn left, but you went straight. Any questions so far? You guys have a little publication or something that says, this is how you drive in a roundabout? We do. So DMV is trying to be more environmentally friendly. Um, and as such, we've stopped printing our driver's ed manual. Um, all the information on things like the roundabouts or lane changes or anything to do with driving is available online. Our handbook is available online in a PDF format. So um, while it's not ideal with some of the people that don't have computer skills or don't use the computer, it is available online to be printed off. Um, if you don't have a computer, you can, you can go into a service center and ask them to get you a page. We won't print you the whole manual because it's a couple hundred pages, um, but we will we will print pages off if you need that. So there is a roundabout link on our DMV website, which should be located on your handout um, on the back, the main website here. Um, but we try to, to be environmentally friendly and we not have paper materials printed as often as we can. In the back. Um, I work at a library and we've printed them off and made it available for checkout for people that run into that problem because yep. we had a lot of people coming in with that same issue. Yep. That's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. So quite often, especially in Madison, we see a lot of college students coming from um, overseas that are coming for a study abroad. Um, and they want the manuals. And some of them pull it up on their phone and there's a smart um, app that they can have um, to reference the manual on their phone, but we defer a lot of folks to the public libraries. And many public libraries will have the manual printed on hand to, to look at and view. Um, some will allow you to print, but they'll charge you like a page copy, which can get expensive considering the amount of pages that our manuals are, but 
Um, there are options out there for that. The best, the best case is just to view it online and, and try to study it when, when appropriate. Um, that's our ultimate goal. I work with the Alzheimer's Alliance in Madison, okay. and I'm wondering, I work with a lot of families and individuals who have um, dementia, and the license in driving is such a big, big deal yep. for them. Do you have, it seems like there's a lot of gray area, do you guys have guidelines we do. for people? Yep. Yep. And I'll touch on this later in my presentation. The question is, do we have guidelines for people um, with their licensing in terms of when we're looking to, to maybe take that privilege away or reduce that privilege? We certainly do. Um, throughout the years, we've partnered with many medical professionals to learn more about disease and learn about health conditions that we don't know. I should note that none of my people in my unit, myself included, are medical professionals. Um, I am not going to make a, a, an assumption on a medical condition or pretend to even say that I know enough about it um, to be confident in that. Um, we have we have several pages of guidelines per conditions and we work closely with our each medical provider to, to ensure that we understand what the condition is and how it's going to safely impact your your licensing in order to be able to operate um, this has been established many years ago um, doctors um, healthcare professionals they're not reliable for their decisions when they sell, send us your information they're not going to be held accountable if they say that you're safe to drive and we say okay and then two weeks later you have a fatality involved accident it's, they can't come back on them. So we rely heavily on them to give us as much as they can about your condition um, or your situation so we can make an appropriate decision. We are the licensing authority. We just take the doctor's recommendations very seriously when they come in. So yes, those aren't available to the public. They're not. No, no, okay. no. Um, if you want to know more about how that impacts you, if, if you have someone who's got a condition and they're curious about it, they should be the ones to call us and we will talk to them more in detail about their specifics. Um, because it's it's all individually based. Does that answer your question? Anything else before we move on? The driving too slowly. Yep. I'm a caregiver for a <coughs> person who has dementia. She doesn't like to drive fast. Yep. And sometimes you can't necessarily get to where you're going without driving fast. Yep. Or sometimes you get on. Highway 83 going south out of Hartford, and there's no place to turn off, sure. and there's no place. So, I don't know what to do. And so, my curiosity is getting very anxious. Yeah. And, you know, stuff's happening, and things are escalating. So, I just flipped on my hazards. Like, I couldn't get off the road. Mm -hmm. There was no turn. Do you think that was a acceptable way to handle it? Yeah, in, that, in the heat of the moment, traffic, absolutely. Traffic was the, if you can hear her in the back, the question is talking about driving too slowly and, and where you may live in a rural area that doesn't have roads that are slower speeds. And you pull out of your driveway on the 55 or 45 or even greater. Um, and so our recommendation um, is that you, you take that to the next level. If you're not comfortable with them and their ability to operate, then we want to we want to focus more on maybe getting that license taken away or reducing where they can drive or roads. No, I was drive. driving. Oh, you were driving. The person has already had their license taken away, but she loves to drive. Sure. So we, I'll talk about this in a little bit about our actual processes, but we do have processes in place to restrict them. Is she still licensed? Or she, you said she's canceled? She's canceled. She's canceled. So you're the one driving. Is she afraid of the speed, or are you yeah, afraid? Yeah, she just um, gets in her head to go fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, when it comes to something like that, a different type of conversation is probably going to have to be had. Unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do about where you're, you're, you reside or where you're coming from. If the speed limit's 55, we'd like you to be going 55, unless weather conditions or something else permits you from doing so. Um, because those around you are going to be going that speed, and, and quite often they're going to be going greater than that speed, and as sad as that is. Um, so if, if you live in an area or a loved one lives in an area and they're not able to comfortably go, whether they're riding or whether they're driving at that speed, we recommend maybe you have a different conversation to see about if you can get them relocated to somewhere that wouldn't be so much. I know that personally my mother-in-law lives in a two-story home. She's getting to that age where it's more difficult for her to go up and down these stairs. And, and so we're at that point where we're having a conversation with her that maybe it's time to give it up and get a condo and you can maybe rent a garden plot somewhere. Um, because that's what she loves to do. That's why she has the house that she's got, right? But we, we want to make sure that she's happy in her days um, as, as they are numbered depending on your situation. But we also want to make sure that she's safe and able to enjoy herself. Having this great two-story house where she can only be in half of it isn't conducive to her 
the way we want it to. So perhaps you need a conversation with her about that. Um, because unfortunately, we don't want you off getting on that highway at a lesser speed. Um, Right, right, right. And that's the challenge, right? Is that you're trying to get through to these people that it's good for them and that it's the best for them, but we need to get them to have to buy in so it's easier on the loan ones that are trying to assist them. So that kind of ties into things that we should look forward to. My next slide. So the loved ones is what we're, we're relying on. Um, it's, it's a gradual process. Um, and you can, you're going to know your loved ones who have these conditions and, and what sets them off and what, what their condition is, whether it's greater or whether it's slower or whether it's onset quicker. Um, you can assess a driver's individual level of functioning just by observing their day-to-day. -day. Um, not necessarily in a motor vehicle specifically, but outside of a vehicle as well. Um, the, the key sign to look for is cell memory changes. Um, maybe they have difficulty completing simple tasks or they come into a room and they're not sure why they came into that room. Um, it, like I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be behind the wheel when you're, when you're observing these folks and, and your loved ones. Um, a mood change is a typical sign of early dementia. Um, confusion, maybe they don't remember your face, they don't remember a conversation you had a minute ago or two minutes ago or last week even. Um, coordination is an element to that. Um, they have difficulty judging distance and space, or they get lost in familiar spaces. Um, troubles communicating can be a sign of, of early dementia. Um, and they're less alert to things that are happening around them, or they need more prompting and personal care. Uh, I touched on mood swing or mood change. Being repetitive. Um, how, how many times have you had a conversation with someone and you already had this conversation and you know the outcome? But to them, it's like the first time they're having it. These are signs that we're looking for you should be looking for. And, and like I said, as a department of division, our goal is safety. That can be your selling point as well. If you're concerned because you're hearing this story again, or you're hearing this situation one more time, and, 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 and I don't know that you're necessarily safe to be doing what you're doing, or, or that's, that's the selling point for you. Um, misplacing things is another common, common sign to look for. So this is, the next part here is what is DMV's process? And this is what you're probably here for. Um, it's a tough road. Taking the keys away is a tough decision. It's not only hard on the person that you're taking the license from or that you're looking to have the license taken from, but it's hard on those that are the loved ones involved in that life, right? You take mom's keys away, now you're responsible for taking her everywhere. Um, and, and you already have enough going on. Um, and, and it's just that much more burdensome to be able to make sure that she's safe, or he's safe and happy, um, and that, that you don't have to worry about them. But then, you also want to be involved in their life, and so taking the keys away, you're going to be either cut out of the will, or you're going to be, <laughs> yeah, 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 or you're going to be um, at, at arms with your other loved ones that are maybe doing the same thing. It's best for mom, but my sister doesn't want to talk to her about it, and I do because I'm closer and she doesn't live here. Um, so that's where DMV sort of steps in. We don't mind being the bad guy. Um, we take a lot of abuse on our calls and through email. And if you read some of the stories of what happens on the roadways, gentlemen here in front have probably written a few reports that we've reviewed time and time again. Um, it's scary. Um, but the goal is to keep everyone safe. And so as, as a caregiver, as a loved one, you need to have that conversation. But if you're not comfortable having that conversation, there are other options. You can go to a medical provider. Um, maybe they can have that conversation. Bear in mind, most medical providers are paid for their services, correct? And they don't always like being the bearer of bad news because then they're not going to get their patients back. Um, so they, they do their best to, to make sure they're safe and that we're safe and that everyone is happy. But at the end of the day, they're also considering that in their element with their decision and conversation. So DMV can step in and we can be the bad guy. Um, and we don't mind it. Like I said, our goal is safety. We'll take the abuse to ensure that you're safe beyond the moment. Um, the first step in the process, it kind of depends on everybody's situation, but the most common way that we're notified about a problem is through what we call the MV3141, or a Driver Condition Behavior Report. This form is typically submitted by law enforcement. That's not to say that the general public can't submit this form, but typically law enforcement lets us know, based on an incident on the roadway, mom was driving down the highway on a one-way road or going the wrong way against traffic she made a left-hand turn up a ramp to get on going the wrong direction, um, or they were swerving in and out of the lanes, or they were stopped along the side of the roadway and they don't remember how they got there and their car is 
dead because they ran out of gas they were sitting there for so long. Um, the 3141 is sub submitted to DMV or received by DMV and we take action on it. Um, I should step back. The, the 3141 um, behavior report can be, like I said, can be can submitted from the general public, but we need positive identification on that, and we need two signatures to confirm that it's right. So if you don't like your neighbor, because they're always driving through your yard, and they're always making noise late at night, you can't submit a behavior report on that unless you get someone else to sign off on the same thing that you witnessed. And, and, and you laugh, but it happens. Um, and then you also need to remember, remember positive identification. We're not law enforcement, you're not law enforcement, so we, we can't take you at your word alone. But you can't say that I saw this truck driving down the street and, I, and we at DMV know that this truck's registered to John Holloway, right? And I'm a really good driver, but apparently you don't think so, so you submitted this. We're gonna need positive identification from two people that state, we saw this person driving, we know it was this person because of, I don't know, I'm friends with them at Bingo Night. Um, so once we receive that application, uh, we notify the driver in writing. Um, and the, the behavior and condition report that we receive usually means we're going to send you to your doctor to make sure that you're men mentally safe or physically safe um, and stable behind the roadway. So we're going to send you a letter with a report that we want you to take to your medical provider thank you, to, to bring that, to send it back to us for us to review it. Um, so the driver sent the medical form. We're asking for you to bring that back. We give you a, a limited time to bring that back, depending on the behavior report that we receive or the condition that we know exists. Um, depends on the amount of time that we give you to get that back. But typically, it's 30 days. Um, and that includes mailing times for us to send you correspondence and for you to send it back in. And then we at DMV, in turn, have 10 days as our set goal for certain reports, three days for others, to review that report and re react. Whether you're OK, your doctor says you're fine, it was just a one-off, um, and we'll leave you alone should something else come up, we'll look at you again. Or whether the doctor has concerns about a condition and then we're going to need to follow up with you, or maybe we're going to require a retesting per your doctor or per the situation. It kind of, each situation is unique. So there's not one true size fits all for everybody's situation, but in general terms, when we, be, we become aware of a condition and your doctor states that you need to be retested, we go through that retesting <coughs> process. The process all told takes about 60 days, or can take about 60 days, um, but we try to get that done in, in the quickest time frame possible. And, and while the letters may come across as threatening, um, we're only letting you know your timelines because we don't want you to get to that cancellation point. It's harder to get your license back if you do. Um, so the driver's asked for a medical form. Um, in that letter, it mentions that your license could be canceled if you don't comply, and then we'll give you the timeline based on the date of that letter. Um, for those of you who are dealing with the loved ones or dealing with the situation, that letter is your key. Um, if you lose that letter, or they lose that letter, they can certainly call us and we can pull the file and pull the record and we know more about it. But that letter is their, their key to, to helping them be successful. We'd like them to take that with them when they go to the DMV for their testing. So that tells the agents at the counter why, why they're here. Not for the reason that they're there. We have no, our field service center agents don't know the reason why you're being asked to retest. Only my unit knows that. Um, we keep that confidential. We won't even talk to you about it unless you're with that loved one or that driver who is under that situation and they give consent to allow us to talk to you about their medical history or their record or where they're at. Um, long story short, their, the license could be canceled if they don't comply, if they don't complete the required events that we set forth. Um, and then um, sometimes, occasionally, more often than not, that driver is going to be tested. So if I had to take a driving test today, I don't know that I could pass it. Um, I'm 37. Um, I'm not that old, but as we all know, the longer you drive, the more comfortable you get behind the wheel, the more mistakes you might make, and they just become habit. Um, and, and so um, it can be tough for someone who's got other symptoms, they're, they're starting dementia, or they have something else going on, it can be tough for them to go through this testing process. And we give them an appropriate amount of time to ensure that they're not an endangerment to themselves on the roadway or others on the roadway, but we want them to have adequate time to study for these tests, they can practice with, with a friend or a family member, um, and so they can be successful. That's our goal. Um, we, we don't like taking away that freedom um, when it's unnecessary. We, we want to make sure that people have that, and that's sometimes the last thing that they have before, before they're put into assisted living. They have that freedom to go to a car night or to go to the grocery store to get eggs for their, their cake that they're baking for Thanksgiving, or, or actually it's probably pie, but... Um, <laughs> That's, that's their freedom, that's their privilege, right? But we wanna make sure that they're safe. So, end result is they may be tested, 
The testing process is, it can be intimidating, it can be scary. We test now on computers for the science and the knowledge test. Um, you should know that you can ask the DMV service centers to give you a paper test. Um, so if you're scared of computers, it's all touch screen. We're actually looking to upgrade those with better ones now even still. It's all done through touch screen. Um, it's in a closed area where there's five or six testing units together. So they may be testing next to someone who's 16 getting their license for the first time. But if they're not comfortable taking that, we encourage them to try it. They have five chances to pass in their time frame. They technically get a year to pass all these tests or to take those tests five times. But we give them five attempts to pass if they're not successful in the first. So if they're not successful, they still have the element to, to try and do it one more time. And then once they complete their science and their knowledge tests and we do their vision screening and we ensure that they're safe, that they know the rules of the road, now we're going to do a skills test. Um, the skills test is a longer version of what you may have had when you were first getting your license. Mm -hmm. Depending on where you want to drive depends on your skills test. So as a supervisor, I've been in four car accidents on ride-alongs only. I, I never, never wanted to be an examiner. Um, I just didn't like the idea of getting in the car. My wife is great, but I'm scared to ride with her sometimes too. <laughs> and, and I think we all have that feeling when you're not in control um, of, of, of wondering where are we going to go on this ride. But as an examiner, they're highly trained in, in what to look for in the, the fresh 16-year-olds or the 18-year-olds that are getting the license for the first time. When you do the re-exam process, we give the senior examiners those people, um, and they're trained even further on things to look for with the, in terms of the bad habits. And you're going to do a different sort of test on these special exams that we call them. So um, the typical 16-year-old test or the first-time driver, it's about a 20-minute test. That involves the pre-trip inspection of looking at the vehicle, um, taking the test, coming back, and talking about how it went. That's about 20 minutes. The, the re-exam that we're going through is about an hour, and that involves the same thing. The pre-trip inspection, make sure that you can control the vehicle safely, um, but it, the road test itself, but then it takes this different element where they're going to take you on the highway, they're going to take you on a longer route, they're going to do a few maneuvers like a quick stop. So they're going to say, at some point during the test, I'm going to have you stop unexpectedly. Um, so let's say you, a, a child runs out in the street and you need to brake or react quickly. So they may give them the warning of when that is going to come, they may not. It's up to the examiner how they do that. Um, and so we're testing those, those drivers that have advanced driving skills in different elements that they would have already experienced through the years that they've been driving. Um, and then depending on how the test goes, depends on the type of license you get. So as you were speaking about the, the fast roads <coughs> and moving and, and that the speed's greater than maybe 25 miles an hour, depending on your road test and how it goes, we may restrict you to roads that are less than that. So you're not going to be able to operate on roads that are 45 or you're not going to be able to operate outside of a five mile radius from your home residence. Um, and so we have different tests available depending on what these drivers want. So when we're talking dementia, and we're talking the, the progression of that disease, um, you may retest and have a full license. And then a year or two later, your condition worsens. And so we may retest you again, uh, as long as we have new information from the doctor warranting the, the need for retesting and we may lessen that license, and you may just get a five mile radius. And those are exams that we actually come to your house, we schedule them in advance, um, and the examiner shows up at your house, and then we say, hey, where do you want to drive? And we'll go to the bingo hall, we'll go to your church, we'll go to the drugstore, the gas station, maybe the library, um, maybe a senior center, um, and then based on where we drive and take you and evaluate you, will determine the outcome of how you're going to be restricted if you are restricted. You may get a free and clear license, if you get daylight driving only, maybe get a five mile radius. Maybe a five mile radius with roads less than 45 miles an hour at posted speed. So there's a variety of options. So most of you in this room probably have an unrestricted driver's license. Um, that's what everyone ultimately wants. But as we have these conversations and as people are diagnosed with this disease, we want to make sure that they're still able to function and feel good about themselves, but we want to make sure that they're safe. So we may give them a license with less of a privilege. I think it's important to note that a license is, is a sense of pride. And sometimes they feel that they need that license because, well, how else do they know who I am? And maybe it's the point that you should make or we need to make that you can get an identification card as well. And it kind of does the same thing as far as identifying you, but it doesn't give you that privilege or that right to drive a motor vehicle. So that's kind of where I'm taking to the next step, which is what you can do. Because of the progression of dementia varies, individuals who have demonstrated the ability to drive should begin to modify their driving and gradually do so. 
okay? Um, we don't want you to take the keys away and say, that's it, you're done. Because that is, that is detrimental to their health, to their mindset. Um, but we want you to have that conversation early in advance um, and talk to that family member. Maybe you limit their driving. Maybe you yourself do the fact finding of, well, where do you want to drive? Do you need to go to the store six times a week? Or can you just go once? Can I go with you? Um, can we plan ahead? And, and you really need to have those conversations while you're evaluating them. And it's important while you're riding with them, if you're riding with them, to evaluate them in the road as well, or on the road as well. We want to ease that transition from driver to passenger. So if you're not safe, or feel that you're not safe sitting in the car, you may need to discuss that with them. Hey mom, you remember why we got honked at twice today by that red SUV? And <laughs> you laugh, but it happens. And it's your concern and compassion for these individuals that will take them to that next level to keep them safe. And, and all the while there, that's the goal. That's what you need to remind them of, is for your safety. Um, there's strength in numbers. Get your family members, your friends, that, that love these ones as well, to buy into that and help them along the way. Um, so alternative transportation is another thing that you can recommend during this process. Um, as you said, she's, she lives in the country, uh, or she lives on a road and she has to go faster than she's comfortable doing so. Maybe recommend alternative transportation or get her moved to a, a location that doesn't have that, where she doesn't need to go that speed. Um, I mentioned this earlier, you can report that unsafe driver using that application. Um, I didn't touch on the fact that you can keep it confidential. Um, you can. Um, law enforcement will submit those randomly or when, they, when the incidents happen, um, and we'll talk about that. They're, they, they're held to a different standard, so their information is not confidential. A lot of the times people are mad at us for taking their license away and, and they're very upset that they're being targeted by local law enforcement. And we refer them to, to deal with their local agencies. But um, when it comes to a behavior report that's submitted from you or I, uh, if you follow the, the proper process, we can keep that confidential. So mom doesn't know that you ratted her out. And it's not that you're ratting her out. It's that you're concerned about her well-being, but you are also concerned about your relationship with them because you want to be involved in them through the end. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we need that positive identification on that application. Just a plate number alone or a vehicle description is not going to be enough from the general public. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but I'll, I'll hit on it again. Wisconsin DOT or WSDOT, um, we don't take action based on a person's advanced age. Um, we have plenty of 16-year-olds um, who are on our radar due to their medical, medical conditions. Um, and our goal is to give them that freedom so they can have that same functionality that many of us have. Um, but we also want to keep them safe. And so they may have a condition that warrants us to follow up on that every two years to, to ensure that it's not progressing in a manner that causes them to be unsafe. So the, the, the elderly part is part of this disease, um, but it doesn't have to be the only reason that we're, that we're looking at them. And, and you want to know that the person's age has nothing to do with it. So when they start saying, well, it's because I'm old, it's because I'm on oxygen, it's not the sole reason that we're looking for you. It might be the start of how we got to, to know you, um, but it's not the only reason that we're looking at it. We don't retest based on age, unless you're a school bus driver over 70, um, and that's just to keep the students on board safe. We want to make sure that they're, they're functioning at that ability with that class vehicle and those people on board. So once they hit 70, they're required to do more frequent testing. Um, but it, they're also required to do that testing, that same testing, every renewal cycle. So it's nothing to do with their age other than they hit a certain threshold that we want to just ensure that they're safe. School bus drivers only, okay? Um, again, DMV is the bad guy. Oh, we got a question. So if a person is tested because there's concern and they do get their license, is that what the time frame then is for them to do the check more frequently? Nope. So the question is if you're tested and you pass, is there more frequent checkups or, or is there a time frame? Um, every situation is sort of unique based on what condition you may have. Um, if you test and you pass your test, and you get an unrestricted license, we're gonna be done with you for the testing requirements. We're not gonna keep following up on you and requiring you to test. That said, if you have a progressive medical condition, we may put you on a 12-month follow-up, or a two-year follow-up, or a six-month follow-up, some of you even as close as a three, depending on your condition. And what that means is that we're gonna ask you in three months, or 12 months, or two years, to submit another form to us from your doctor that tells us whether your condition has changed. And then your doctor can advise us again to maybe retest you. So it's not uncommon to have someone test more than 
more than a few times in their licensing history. Um, we typically, unless the doctor can seriously justify it, we typically won't test you more than once in a 12 month time frame. So at earliest, you may be tested annually, but that's gonna be after some significant clarification from your medical provider. We see this a lot where you go for your annual checkup and they submit the form and the doctor's not comfortable with you because they don't know how you drive. They don't know whether you're reckless behind the wheel or not, but medically you're safe. So they're gonna say that yes, this person's safe to operate. Yes, I think you should test them. Do you need to be tested? Because we just saw you 10 months ago when you passed with flying colors. We're gonna write out to the doctor for why. And if they come back to say, well, I don't know how he drives, then we'll, we're gonna leave you alone. We're not gonna make you be tested. Um, but if there's a medical condition that warrants us, if there's a change in your health, then it's likely that we may retest you if we deem it to be a, a safety concern. So there are follow-ups in place. Every situation is sort of different, um, but it all depends on the, situ on the situation of the disease you may or may not have and where we're gonna be at from a DMV perspective. But we don't, we don't mind following up on you. We don't typically like it. Um, because we want you to have a free and clear license and live a happy and healthy life. But if it comes to safety on the roadways, we're gonna kind of investigate deeper just to ensure. Um, anybody else while we're stopped? So DMV can be helpful in a number of ways. Like I said, I don't mind being the bad guy. Uh, we, we do it all the time. Um, but we can provide you the forms, the, the conversations that we're having today. If you're concerned about a loved one or their condition, you can call into our unit and we'll talk to you. Um, phone numbers listed on the back of your handout here. And you can call and talk to my agents at any time between the hours of 7.30 and 4.30, Monday through Friday. Um, we'll provide you the form or the guidance to how to, to have that conversation or the steps that you might be able to take um, and then we also defer you to the doctor, um, and the doctor can be the same. They have the forms that are pretty fluent in our requirements and how to fill these applications out and how to even submit them back to us. Sometimes the doctor will fill out your application and send it to you, and then sometimes they'll fax it in on your behalf, and then you can call us at a later time and see if we receive it. Um, again, we're going to be helpful. We're going to test that driver for safety and restrict that license if appropriate. Um, if you're concerned about one's driving ability, um, you can always defer them to a driver education school, and they can give them the knowledge of the roadways, they can give them the behind the wheel testing. We're not gonna take those results from them. Um, and, and we may, you may submit those to us and we'll, we'll put them in your file, but we don't really care whether you were successful behind the roadways with them or not. We're gonna test you on our own road and we're gonna test you with our own testing patterns. But it's something to ease the driver to say, yep, I'm comfortable driving, I, I'm confident in my abilities. This test shows that I know what I'm talking about and I, I didn't have to feel pressure from being at the DMV because if you come and test with us and you're not successful, we're gonna take your license. Um, but if you go and test with a driver education course um, and you're not successful, they're gonna have a different form of guidance for you into, into how to get you back licensed or how to, how to keep your license. We're not gonna take it away based on their test results for them. Um, that said, we don't encourage folks to come into us and say, well, my son says that I'm a bad driver. I want to test because we don't, we're not in the habit of that. Um, if, if you've got something to prove, we're going to only retest you if, if you have a medical condition that warrants it. We don't retest you otherwise because um, we don't have the staff to do these additional tests. And, and really, if there's no immediate cause for safety that we know about, we're not going to take action on it. Um, and then, like I said, once we receive those forms, we're going to follow up with the doctor um, if we need to. So sometimes we'll ask for follow-ups randomly throughout the, your, your lifetime. And sometimes we'll ask for more clarification if a doctor submits a form that's maybe incomplete or might give us information about another, another area in your, your health history that could cause alarm for us. And that takes me to my final slide. Um, does anyone have any other questions that we haven't touched on? We've got about 15 minutes, give or take, to go back. So we had our loved one already evaluated by a doctor for cognitive deficit of the driving. They recommend that she not drive. Um, kind of taking the keys to the car wasn't safe to drive either, but sure. um, I don't know that the doctor sent it in or not, but um, for somebody who you said that you won't talk to family members about what's going on unless that person's there, so if that person is not on board with losing their license then they hide their mail and destroy it, and so we wouldn't know what steps are being taken or how far along it is with you guys, what do we do? Correct. So. The only way that you could do that is if you had like a power of attorney that gives you permission to, to act yeah, on behalf of this. Yeah. <laughs> and it's gonna be a, a tough situation or a unique situation to be in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, safety and security is one of our main focuses at DMV. We don't talk to anybody about anybody's record other than that individual. That includes son or daughter if they're a minor. 
Um, and, and the reason for it is because we, we can't verify over the phone who you are. Um, if you, I could call in, I know my wife well enough where I could call in and get me some information if I wanted to. And, and we, we, we know that when we're on the phone with you. Um, so we need verification from that person that it's okay. And if they're not willing to give it, then, then maybe the, the next step for them is to take that, you don't know because they're not telling you, but to take that next step and maybe submit a behavior or conditional behavior report. Um, and if they don't comply, we're gonna cancel them. So um, it was mentioned in one of my previous presentations uh, about people driving without a license. So we're not law enforcement. We regulate and issue these these licenses, but we can't stop you. We at DMV, the state patrol might, but we can't take any action on you if you're driving without your license. That's not our industry, that's not our business. We will cancel your license, we will suspend, we will revoke you, but that doesn't mean that, that people still don't drive on an invalid product or without even having a product. So that's where you hear someone was convicted of their 10th OWI. They don't have a license. Um, we're, we're not naive to that, but they're still driving without our consent. And so they may be hiding it from you, they may have shredded those documents, or you might not know that, but they will be canceled on system if they don't comply with our testing requirements once we learn about them. And that's their just decision to do so. We, we don't like it, but we can't do anything about it. Well, they can also check the DMV website to see if they are valid in our Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We do have an eligibility checker on our website. You can check the status of your own licenses. Businesses check the status of their CDL driver licenses. You just have to enter the critical information in order to do so. Uh, humor is known. My stepmother, we were going through the procedures of having the doctors say, yeah, she should not drive anymore. Well, her license expired while we were, and she went in and renewed them for eight years. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then she says, well, the DMV says I can drive. Yeah. So that situation happens, um, it's basically a timing. Yeah. Thing. So if you're at the doctor and you're getting a medical report and then you decide to go in and renew that and we don't know about you, doctors are not required by law in Wisconsin to submit medical information once once they have a condition that warrants it. Most of them do. Most of them know the laws of the rules of the roadway and they're ultimately concerned for your safety. But they're not required to say that you have diabetes or you had an epileptic seizure um, and the DMV needs to know about it. We, we pulled that to the, the general public on their own. So I didn't mention this earlier and I will now. There are basically three ways that you come onto our radar. One, you come into a DMV service center and you're, you're, you're honest, which we appreciate, on your application that says you had a condition in the last 12 months that would warrant us to, to want to know more about. That's like question nine on the 3001, which is our driver's license application. Um, if you do that, we're going to take action. We're going to look at you closer. Uh, the second way is law enforcement. They see an incident on the roadways, um, and they, they send us a behavior report, and then we'll take action on that. And then the third is from your medical provider, or maybe a loved one who submits that behavior conditional report. So those are the main ways that DMV learns about these conditions. Um, it just could be a coincidence that, that, that she was in her treatment. It was, it was humorous. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And the eight-year license, it's just that we don't have anything longer than an eight-year license. We don't have anything shorter than a license. So um, if you get that eight-year license, that's great. Um, but we may need to revisit that, and we'll change your restrictions first per your eight-year license. So you may have a current license that's free and clear, but on system, you don't. Law enforcement, when they stop you, if they stop you, they're going to see the current restrictions that you may have and question why you're driving um, outside of those restrictions that you are. I, I work with a bunch of the clinics that do the differential for diagnosing dementia throughout the state. And one of the things, so they often submit this third route where they submit the medical forms. Sure. One of the things in the last year is the VA system is no longer allowing their providers to do that. <coughs> so they can no longer submit that medical form. Okay. I, I hadn't heard that. That's in the last year. I think it started like January or so. But that, we've been told that at our clinic network meetings that they no longer can submit them. So they're not going to submit anything like that? Or they no, gonna... I don't know if, if you send them documentation, they may pursue a release of information from that patient, but they're not able to submit any more up front. That's the first that I'm learning of that. And that's unfortunate. It, I think they're quoting a HIPAA violation. Okay. And so I, I have a feeling there'll be some trends on this. Okay. I'll have my legend liaison look at that more closely. Um, he's pretty in tune with any changes that are coming out. 
Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you mentioned school bus drivers. After they hit 70, they have to be tested more frequently? Yep, every two years. But how about people who are behind the big rigs? Oh. Yeah. So they're, big rigs are different. It kind of depends on what you operate when you drive a CDL or whether you hold a commercial license. If you're driving interstate commerce, you're going to be held to the standards of needing a federal medical card, which federal medical cards are, are only issued from DOT approved physicians. Um, and there, there, there's been a recent, over the last four years, there's been a lot of changes that involve getting that card issued. Um, and actually there's a change coming right now in terms of diabetes as well, it starts in November. But um, to be an interstate commerce, interstate is going from Wisconsin to Illinois with your product, or coming from New Jersey to your product. Um, if, you're, if you're driving an interstate commerce in a CDL rig, or regardless of what you're hauling, um, you're going to need to carry a, what's called a federal medical card. And those cards have a maximum life of two years. So you're going to be going to that physician every two years and updating that card. Um, physicians have the right to give you less than that. So they can give you a three-month card. Or they can give you a year, depending on your, your physical health. And if you don't maintain that card with us, we cancel you. Um, and it's just a, it's a, it's a downgrade, as we call it. So it, it doesn't take anything to get your license back. You just need to bring us an updated card. Um, it's not a reinstatement fee or a revocation. It's going to just be a downgrade where you're you're not going to have that class license. Even though your license card itself may show it on system, it's just going to show your <coughs> class D. So if you hold a class A, which is the, the uh, combination truck, tractor, and trailer, um, you're going to hold that card in your hand that shows A through D, but on system you may just have the D, or maybe a D and an M, a class M is a motorcycle. Um, so if you don't maintain that card every two years or every year, depending on your health, um, you won't have a, a legal valid product. That's for interstate driving. In trust state, it's just within the state of Wisconsin. Depending on how you operate, depending on what you haul, who you work for, what you're using your CDL for, you may or may not be held to the standards of holding that. But in some cases, the driver is going to be held by their employer to hold that or required by their employer to hold that. So every situation is a little different. But for CDLs, it's only really pertinent to those that are driving interstate that have to maintain that car. Um, Wisconsin does have grandfathering for those who have held the CDL since 1996, and they haven't been revoked or suspended, um, and they've had a good driving record, they can maintain that without having to have that. But it's not going to allow them to cross state lines. And it's not necessarily them crossing state lines, it's what they're hauling. If you work for Pepsi, and you're, you're at a Pepsi distribution center here in Wisconsin in Beloit State, and you drive to Illinois to drop off at the Walgreens or the, the Piggly Wigglies or whatnot, um, that's interstate commerce, so you're going to be required to have that federal medical card. Even though um, the product that you're hauling around might not physically cross state lines in your truck, it does at some point. And so that's, or it came from wherever, vice versa. Are you following me? Anything else? I got about five minutes. Just kidding. I'm not sure I'm sorry. I just want to share something. And I've run into this. People are afraid to put in driver condition reports for family members or you guys maybe take care of a family and that family member is free to do it. Don't be afraid to get law enforcement involved. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. I, well, I've done it a lot for people where I, they don't want to be the bad guy. I'll be the bad guy. I get to know that I've had people trying to get me for doing this, but yeah. that's fine. <laughs> I, it doesn't bother me. We get, we get, as, as, is it Dan? No. Don, Don said, we get a lot of reports from law enforcement. They're our friends. We don't question them. Same thing as we don't question your doctor. The only time we're going to question your doctor is if we get a report for the same conditions, no change in health history, within a year's time, we're going to say, is this really relevant? Do we need to retest? But when it comes in, law enforcement, your, your, your friends and your family members that are being questioned on this, they're going to hate law enforcement. Um, because I got pulled over and the guy, he's targeting me. He knows who I am and every time he sees me, he pulls me over. That is not true. He's got way more to do than to know where John Holloway is on September 21st at 10 o'clock in the morning, right? You got way more important things to be doing. But when you notice an incident on the roadway or something that causes concern, you're going to take action. And that's what we tell these callers when they call in. Um, and if they have a challenge with it, then they can talk to the local PD that's, that's issuing these citations. But the same thing is going to result is that, yes, this is what happened. You may not remember it. You may not recall it. You may not agree with it. But the fact of the matter is it was witnessed. 
and these guys are credible in their sourcing, and we back them 100%. But we will not reach out to that department and say, what are you doing to John Holloway over in Fort Atkinson? Why? Why are you bothering him with his driving ability? Same thing for your doctor. Unless, unless there's reason that the report's incomplete, or it's the same report from last year, and then we find out, oh, well, I just marked that for everybody because I, I don't know how he operates, then we'll look at that and take that into consideration. But nine times out of 10, we're still focused on your safety and the, the fact that you know there was an incident involving your mom. We, more, all people need to realize that any police officer or fire department, they're not out there to look for you. They're out there to save you. That's correct. No, they're there to help. This is DMV is. We're, we'll be the bad guy, and we often are. Um, I, I can tell you right now, I just asked for a show of hands how many people like coming to the DMV. <laughs> I'd probably be the only one. <laughs> but in all, honesty, in all honesty, we're good people, and we just care about the safety of those around you. We, we really do. That's our focus. And, and if you saw the side of DMV that I see, everyone in the world would think differently about how we act, because we're not here to take anything away that isn't for safety. Yeah, one minute. I was wondering, how would someone ask law enforcement to get involved with what you're talking about? Like, if there wasn't any kind of accidents, but they have these concerns, can you just kind of give an example of how they Just go to your local law enforcement, you could officer explain the concerns you have. Okay. Um, some things we can act on, some things we can't. But it, it's like a case by case basis, but at least if we're aware of something going on, if you can't do anything now, maybe we can keep an eye on it, especially if you're, you know, a city community or something like that. The county's a little bit more difficult because there's so much to cover. But when I work like for the city of work, I'm gonna keep an eye on that person. I had a gentleman they stopped a couple of times grabbing without license because the DMV pulled his license due to his eyesight. So uh, just go talk with one of the officers. So I want to close and thank you guys for being here today. You are the the true helpers in this situation. You're the ones that are going to have those conversations and assist in keeping your family members and your loved ones safe. Um, and like I said, our department's here to help. If you have questions about the process, um, so sometimes we're limited in the information we can provide about the individual, but we're always willing to help and discuss the options that you have as, as individuals to keep those people safe. So that's ultimately our goal.